This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. As much of the nation prepares to go back to school, new laws banning transgender athletes from women's and girls sports teams are moving from debates at the state houses to taking effect on the fields. That's playing out in states including Tennessee, Indiana, South Dakota, and Utah. Before we get rolling, we wanna to flag to you that this is a sensitive subject, and the story will feature discussions about mental illness and suicide, as well as transphobic concepts and misgendering of transgender people. These new state level bans fit into a broader trend that we've seen at just about all levels of athletics, everywhere from state legislatures to international sports governing bodies, where new laws and rules have been written to exclude transgender people from sports that line up with their gender. So now that these laws are actually taking effect, what will the impact be for the athletes and the sports they play? Let's start at the top of international sports and work our way down. Although the International Olympic Committee has allowed transgender athletes to compete in the Olympics since 2004, it took until last year's Tokyo Olympics for there to even be any openly transgender athletes competing in any sport at the Olympics. And while one transgender athlete assigned female at birth won a gold medal with Canada's women's soccer team, no transgender athlete has meddled in an individual competition. If you're an athlete, transitioning can take a toll on your body, something that transgender athlete performance researcher and distance runner Joanna Harper saw both in her research and firsthand. One of the most important things in, in my development was the change in speed that I experienced uh, after I started hormone therapy in August of 2004, within nine months of starting hormone therapy, I was running 12% slower. And that's the difference between serious male distance runners and serious female distance runners. But as transgender women participate and win sports competitions, it's gotten some people upset and claiming they have an unfair advantage. There isn't much evidence out there yet that quantifies how much of an advantage transgender women athletes may have, but she told us that regardless of gender, at the highest levels of competition, there's nuance and a middle ground here that can vary depending on the sport. And the fact that we don't know the magnitude of that advantage is, is also extremely important because we allow advantages in sport. What we don't allow is overwhelming advantage. Uh, and, and for instance, uh, we let left-handed baseball players play against right-handed baseball players, even though they have numerous advantages, but we don't let heavyweight boxers get into the ring with, with flyweight boxers. Policies have varied sport to sport to ensure transgender athletes can compete, but without the potentially overwhelming advantage of naturally higher testosterone, which can allow some transgender athletes to compete but exclude others, including intersex women who actually aren't transgender. Many sports governing bodies or leagues have required testosterone levels to be below certain levels or requiring a certain amount of time to pass after transitioning. And transgender athletes themselves have proposed middle ground options. After Brazilian volleyball player Tiffany Abreu started to play on a women's team after her transition, she suggested quotas limiting the number of transgender women per team. But even though the IOC put a call out earlier this year for sports governing bodies to make transgender athlete policies with inclusion in mind, most of the recent sporting rule changes have headed more toward exclusion. You've probably heard about Leah Thomas, the transgender female swimmer for the University of Pennsylvania, who set records at the Ivy League women's swimming competitions and won the NCAA Division I championship in the 500-yard freestyle. Swimming's international governing body, FINA, issued new, stricter rules in June, banning transgender women who transitioned after the age of 12 from competing just a few months after Thomas's success led to outcry from some swimmers and media voices. Other sports are expected to follow FINA's lead and exclude most transgender women. Thomas has still faced hate and vitriol online, even as she's now banned from swimming at NCAA or international women's swimming competitions. But while Thomas won one major competition, we should be clear she wasn't dominating and still trailed behind the best cisgender swimmers. The NCAA record in the women's 500-yard freestyle was set by multi-time Olympic gold medal winner Katie Ledecky, 
who swam it in four minutes and 24.06 seconds in 2017. Meanwhile, Leah Thomas, her championship winning time in 2022 was more than nine seconds slower at four minutes and 33.24 seconds. And it's not just swimming where transgender athletes, especially those who win in women's sports, face attacks. We talked with Veronica Ivey. She's a competitive track cyclist and a transgender woman. She earned a PhD in philosophy and has done years of research on the ethics around transgender inclusion in sports. She also received hateful messages after winning an age group championship in 2019, but she sees sports as her outlet. Facetiously, one of my favorite mugs says I ride to burn off the crazy. Uh, it is a way that I manage things like depression and anxiety and the PTSD I get from people harassing me and sending me death threats. That contention over trans inclusion can seep down to lower levels of sports, and that can have an effect on younger athletes. Sports are absolutely vital for kids to feel included, to feel a sense of community, to develop critical life skills like leadership, like ability to communicate with folks who are, are different from you. Uh, there are so many very clear benefits of sports participation for youth that are in hundreds of studies. That's Anne Lieberman, director of policy at the LGBTQ Sports Inclusion Advocacy Group, Athlete Ally, and a three-time national champion Muay Thai fighter. They had personal childhood experience with inclusion in sports making a difference. Sports was one of the only places where I felt like myself, where the bullying stopped, where everything just fell away for a moment and I could be in my body, I could be connected with my peers and feel like I was just like any other kid. That inclusion can make all the difference for transgender youth who report higher rates of anxiety, depression, and mental health issues. A 2022 study published in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence found that 86% of transgender youth surveyed reported being suicidal and more than half, 56%, reported they previously tried committing suicide. But even as youth sports come with lower stakes, Republican legislators see transgender athletes as a threat. This is fundamentally about fairness. It ensures both biological females, biological males have a level playing field. We don't want to deprive any of the females of these opportunities. Kentucky passed legislation banning transgender girls from competing in youth sports over the Democratic governor's veto. And we should note here that since the ban took effect, at least one female athlete hasn't been able to compete. We'll be talking with her in just a moment. As of July, 18 states, including Kentucky, have passed similar bills. Republican governors in Indiana and Utah also saw legislators override them. But in Utah, Governor Spencer Cox issued a statement along with his veto, pointing out that out of 75,000 kids playing high school sports in Utah, four are transgender, and only one transgender student played in girls' sports. In Kansas, legislators blocked Republican legislators from implementing a ban on transgender athletes. Stephanie Byers, a Democratic state representative in Kansas who is the first Native American transgender state legislator, voted and testified against the bill. And she told us that in Kansas, where the same commission governs both athletic and non-athletic school competitions, the only person seeking recognition as a transgender girl wasn't even looking to compete in a sport. In the state of Kansas, um, it's estimated there are 37,000 girls in athletics uh, in, in, and the, the high school level uh, here in the state. The number of people that had applied to the Kansas State High School Activities Association for a variance on gender this year were seven, six were trans guys, one was a trans girl. And that one trans girl that applied for the variance, I know it wasn't because of athletics. It was because of other activities that are sponsored by the Kansas State High School Activities Association. This all fits into a broader context. Transgender people aren't just being targeted by laws about sports. 27 states considered laws limiting transgender people's access to healthcare in 2020 and 2021, including Arkansas and Alabama, which enacted their bans into law. In Texas, Governor Greg Abbott directed the state to investigate parents 
who help their transgender children get health care as potential child abusers. And in Florida, the Parents' Rights and Education Bill, often labeled the Don't Say Gay Bill by critics, took effect this July and leads to school districts facing the risk of lawsuits if transgender identities are discussed in the classroom before fourth grade. Transgender athletes and advocates say laws like this or athlete bans can dehumanize transgender people and that so many of these laws or efforts to debate transgender inclusion can be addressed by remembering the human effects. To take that away from fragile children is so unbelievably cruel in my view. I, I do believe that these people passing these laws the cruelty is the point. They don't care about protecting women's sport. They just want to be cruel to trans kids. And these laws can affect transgender people off the field too. Even that kid that has no want whatsoever to ever be in athletics, they still feel these things because it's still attacking somebody like them. So that trans girl that nobody knows about who's not even had the courage to sit down and talk with their parents, or they live in a household that, that there's no support going to be there no matter what, they're the ones that feel this too. At its core, this is a human story with human consequences. Our next guest has seen it firsthand and as it currently stands, is banned from playing sports next year. Fisher Wells is 13 years old, entering the eighth grade. She lives in Kentucky and played field hockey helping recruit people to join her team at Westport Middle School. She testified against the Kentucky legislation we mentioned earlier that banned kids like her from playing. I've worked really hard to play this sport. I just hope you'll let me play in eighth grade. I don't care if I don't get to play in high school. I just want to play. And she joins us now accompanied by her dad, Brian, and her mom, Jennifer Fisher, Brian, Jennifer, Thank you so much for joining us here on In The Loop. Fisher, the first question goes to you. Uh, we're gonna turn this into a bit of a scouting report, okay? How do you get into field hockey and how did you get enough, uh, convince enough girls to join the team? Um, I got into field hockey because I knew um, my parents were probably gonna make me play some form of sport. Um, so I was like, hey, that sounds like it could be not boring for a change. <laughs> um, and I think I recruited uh, most, uh, I think my recruiting method was very strong because I was very loud and explosive with it. I love that, very loud, very explosive. Another thing I'm curious about Fisher, you know, what is, what, what's the vibe been like with your, with your classmates as well? How have they responded to you know, you testifying at the at the Capitol. Um, most of them were like, "Oh, that's rad, Fisher." Um, anyway, it's kind of been mellow in the classroom. You know, what are the main things you think adults having these conversations um, maybe don't understand about your experience or about um, you know how this legislation is uh, impacting you? I think I would say that they should probably try to meet some trans people first to like actually play some of these sports instead of just walking around doing their own thing. This one goes to the parents, Brian and Jennifer, clearly, you know, she was able to kind of pull people in and, and really kind of galvanize a group of like-minded folks who wanted to play this sport. Um, you know, what's it like to see her kind of miss out on this opportunity? I mean, it just, it makes me really sad because there's, I mean, there's a couple things, right? The first one is the folks who were for this bill um, made a, an argument that trans people were preventing girls from playing sports, which is on the face of it, ridiculous. But even in, but in Fisher's specific case, um, we wouldn't have had a team without Fisher. And so she actually was um, creating ways for, for, for girls to play sports. Fisher, eighth grade starts in just a few weeks for you. Um, you know, what's the plan for this year? Probably not going to play any sports in eighth grade, honestly. It's tiring, especially when there's a whole bunch of legal stuff that you have to go through. And honestly, I feel like eighth grade's going to be packed enough. 
of homework. Yeah. Powerful of homework. But weren't you thinking about some other sports that are more welcoming? Like what, fencing? Mm -hmm. That might be like a summer thing. Okay. You know, for all the dark stuff, you know, there there is a, a slice of some joy here. You know, tell me a bit about how you feel seeing this effort that she's put in. Um, you know, how proud are you all of, of Fisher and, and, and what she's been able to do? I'm just extremely proud. You know, we had this opportunity to, where Fisher was able to show real character, to show her voice, uh, and then bring that to bear in a very non-academic, non-dry way into a process that we got to see, even if we're very disappointed in the outcome uh, and its real effects on our family. Um, Fisher got to see how this actually happens uh, in kind of a technical way, but also in a very political way. It's a tough way to learn that, uh, but I'm extremely proud of the character that Fisher has shown, the poise, and honestly, the, the kind of refreshing um, uh, kind of realness of her testimony in Frankfurt, which I don't think always happens. It's been, it's been really amazing to hear your story, Fisher, um, and to hear how, how proud your parents are of you. Um, I, I, I wish you the best going into uh, eighth grade. To Fisher, uh, to Jennifer, and to Brian, thank you so much for joining us here on In The Loop. We appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you very much.